Welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists. Today on The Microscopists, I'm joined by a very special guest, Joachim Frank, Nobel Laureate. And we're going to hear about what it was that brought him into electron microscopy to move his software developments to help solve structural biology. It, w- it looked very complicated and then, in fact, <clears throat> then I learned to use it and I broke something uh, right at the beginning and, uh, and it was terrible. And then, <coughs> uh, uh, <coughs> and then, so it really convinced me that I was not, I was not the right kind to actually interact with the instrument. And that's really brought me into uh, the math and the computation and the software design. How we try to move into environmental research. I saw an announcement uh, by the UNESCO uh, that they started some kind of an environmental thing in Kenya. And I applied, I applied for it. Uh, and I, did, I never got a reply. And the way he publishes outside of academia. So I write literary fiction. Uh, and so it's a novel, um, but um, I can best think myself into a scientist. So this is a scientist. It's not me, but it's a scientist. All in this episode of The Microscopists. Hi, I'm Peter O'Toole from the University of York. And today on The Microscopist, I am truly honoured to be joined by Joachim Frank from Columbia University. Joachim, how are you today? Good, thank you, thank you. Except for the thunderstorm going on. Yeah, a, <laughs> if anyone hears any interference, it could just yeah. be the thunder okay. in the background and uh, right. cross fingers, we don't get any power cuts from the back of it. <clears throat> I, I, do you know what? Your career is so illustrious. It is very hard to know where to start on this. So I'm, I'm going to be slightly different to normal, and I'm going to take you back to when you were eight, nine, 10, 11 years of age. <clears throat> what was the first job that you remember wanting to do as a child? The first job? Yeah. What, what, what did you, yeah, I wanted to be a footballer or a fireman. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, it was really, uh, <clears throat> I don't know whether I really had the concept of scientist, but it would have, would have been very close to scientist, because uh, I did uh, experiments uh, uh, under the veranda of my, of my parents' house. Oh, wow. uh, <clears throat> well, there, there, there was a room, a space under the veranda, and that was unused. And so I built shelves there and uh, collected little bottles. These were the Martin Bitter bottles that were left over from uh, parties. Yep. I, I filled them with all kinds of chemicals and, uh, <clears throat> and experimented with, with all kinds of things. I've got to ask what sort of chemicals and where did you get them from? <clears throat> Well, believe it or not, the I, I was able to uh, <clears throat> to buy uh, hydrochloric acid uh, at the in the pharmacy. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I was you know with I think twelve years old. I I, I was able to, to simply get get this acid, um, oh. and uh, and I had gasoline. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> And what, what I also did was um, I had coal, um, which I um, I heard that by heating up coal, one could get gas out of it. So as I built myself a little vessel and filled it with, with coal dust, heated it up from underneath, and then, um, and then had a little tube coming out and was able to to see that one can really light this, the gas that, that comes out of it. That was, I, I must have been eight or nine when I did this. <clears throat> wow, wait, that is, oh, do you know what? I think right now we're probably lucky you're still alive <laughs> after those experiments. How did you get? Yeah, yeah, I had one, one, I, 
I did have one explosion, uh, but uh, I never told my parents about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's quite something. So, so you're very keen from science from an early age. Uh, obviously, the chemistry side, by the sounds of that. So, yeah. I, I presume your studies took you into your first degree, and your first degree was in what subject? Uh, first degree. I'm your, sorry. But, your, yeah. Your yeah, your first degree. What was your degree in? Oh, the degree. The first degree was what, uh, which was called four diploma, uh, which 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 is the BS degree, uh, and it was in physics. I, I mean, the first one was was of course the abitur in high school. Yeah, uh, abitur. You know, uh, which you call A level or something like this. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> And then, and then I went to the University of Freiburg, and got my four diploma, or or a, a BS, the Bachelor of Science. Yeah. So, so from your physics, I, I look. I, I'm a biochemist. I live in the biological world, and I know you exceptionally well by reputation. So you you went into physics. What was your next step? From you, what did you see yourself doing at the time that you graduated? Where did you see your career going at that moment in time? I I really had no idea whatsoever. I I had nothing, and and so, but that was really a decisive, a decisive moment because the um, <clears throat> uh, one of the professors in my exam, uh, he had a relationship to the Studienstiftung, which is the, which is in a foundation and a government foundation partially government foundation um, for for um, funding uh, you know very promising students and so so I, I sort of had excelled in the exam uh, and and then he nominated me and that was very decisive because this Studienstiftung uh, <clears throat> it brought together people from from all kinds of of, of different disciplines, and so it brought me together with biologists, neurophysiologists, and and everything, and and, and cosmologists, and what whatever, you know, <clears throat> and people very of the diverse uh, initial background, and so when I went from Freiburg to Munich, uh, subsequently, I immediately was was put into this circle of people, you know, because they were. Uh, <clears throat> the the Studienstiftung, this foundation was organized in such a way that they had professors uh, which which were the sort of the point persons in in the various cities and and, and they <clears throat> made some kind of a social arrangement so they made parties uh, and outings and, and things like this so so I learned uh, I, I got together with all these different people and so I was really um, and then also this foundation <clears throat> organized um, a cutting edge um, workshops that brought us together with uh, with people in molecular biology, with in in all kinds of advanced uh, fields, in uh, in summer workshops, and so so I was sort of really put in, into this melting pot. Of different disciplines, uh, and uh, so there was nothing planned about it. Uh, but it was very fortunate. In in hindsight, it was very fortunate that I got confronted with with all of these different subjects matters. <clears throat> so I think that's fascinating because that one of the reasons as well is I know you. I think you attend the Lindau Foundation meetings to yes, the yeah. Nobel Foundation meetings, which happen in Germany every year which is probably the biggest gathering of Nobel laureates outside the awards themselves. And it invites lots of early career scientists to come along and to be inspired, but also to network together. So that actually sounds quite similar because obviously all the Nobel laureates have a very broad disciplines of the sciences and it brings everyone together with its early career. So it's, I, you must be a big fan of that because this is now you doing the same back and it's giving you that opportunity yes yes it, it's really uh, <clears throat> i particularly uh, enjoy the lindau meetings uh, 
because it brings me together with a much larger cast of Nobel laureates than in Stockholm. The Stockholm meetings, uh, you know, tend to be, I mean, I've, I've only been to, to a single one. Uh, and, uh, and that was, was really brought together a few people from, from that area. But, but here in, in Lindau, I, got, I had um, uh, an amazing number of people that, um, that I was able to talk to. And then, of course, and then of course, I'm aware of the effect that we all Nobel laureates have on, on students and, and uh, what kind of expectations come. You know, because I remember from the, from the time that I was a student, uh, how much I looked up at um, Nobel laureates and uh, how enjoy, I enjoyed meeting uh, and even seeing one of them from, from, from the distance. You know, it's all very funny to be on the other side of this. So what would your advice be for people attending the Lindau uh, Nobel meeting or at any place that you may be attending, what would your advice be to those early career scientists? Would you say, come up and talk if you have a question? Um, well, yeah, of course, of course. But but everybody everybody is being encouraged uh, to do that uh, who, who attends the Lindau meeting. And, and the students are really, they're not shy. Uh, they... Uh, <clears throat> They con congregate immediately around you, and they want they want to have selfies and things like this. Um, and uh, so I, I think they they know that that the whole thing is geared toward uh, informality. <clears throat> so, we, which is good, and hopefully outside of that as well. And hopefully, actually, these podcasts help break down the barriers because, yeah. I, as an early career scientist long ago, I remember sort of being intimidated and always thinking that the top scientists were work, work, and work. And they must have known what they wanted to do. But as you've said, when you finished your your BS, your bachelor's, that you, you enjoyed science. And you, you had no direction, I presume, at that point, but to continue yeah. enjoying science. <laughs> so where did you go next after your bachelor's? Well, I, I went to Munich, and the only reason I went to Munich was, was that a couple of friends went to Munich, and I thought, you know, I mean, this uh, Freiburg is a little bit, uh, <clears throat> a little bit dull, uh, meanwhile, and I, I just wanted to be in the big city, um, and uh, so, so I simply felt followed, uh, followed a couple of friends there, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, enrolled at the uh, university, uh, did my uh, did a diploma about which is a master uh, thesis, uh, <clears throat> which I, you know, I, I simply got some some something assigned to me. Uh, I didn't know how to, you know, how to go into a particular direction. So I I went I came into a project that was insane. Uh, if if you now think about it, because <clears throat> um, it was an um, a, a privat docent, you know, which, which as a professor in Germany, a privat docent is somebody who doesn't have any portfolio. They he doesn't have any uh, <clears throat> any backing. You know, he is simply he has a title of professor, but but he doesn't really have an, a footing. Okay, so he's typically somehow. In a in a, in a, in a um, in the group of, of somebody else, okay. <clears throat> so 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 he, uh, but he uh, gave me the um, <clears throat> an, a project that was um, that had to do with studying the <clears throat> uh, the backscattering of electrons on molten metal, molten metal. Uh, and uh, the one with the with the with the, <clears throat> uh, I mean, obviously uh, mercury would would be a choice, but uh, you know nobody wants wants to talk uh, to to make experiments with mercury. So the next one was gold. So so I had the job of of <clears throat> getting gold in liquid form and and um, shooting electrons on it 
and then looking at the backscattering of this. Now, everything in vacuum, and and now we have gold in in molten form. Okay, <clears throat> and uh, in order to bring it in, in in the molten form, it had to be kept um, under electron bombardment uh, all by itself. You know, from 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 the back. Right. So it would, in it, yeah, <clears throat> in a little little crucible, uh, being bombarded from the back by electrons in order to keep it in a molten form, uh, which pr of course produces an incredible um, amount of electrons everywhere. So I, and and then I wanted to uh, uh, I wanted to detect electrons that were backscattered from another beam of electrons. So so the whole thing uh, became became an I mean sort of Kafkaesque really. <clears throat> and the only way to do it was to <clears throat> was to make a um, <clears throat> a rectified circuit. Um, and and there's a phase in which the the pot was was be, um, uh, heated and and then there was a phase that I could use for for measuring you know so, and, and and so I flipped back and forth between the two <clears throat> so you remove the contaminating electrons by yeah yeah right, right. Between, between the two of them well I, I'm going to ask now then because that's obviously a very early electron microscope. What was the first microscope that you used? Um, that was um, well. The, the first micro microscope that I actually saw was in my mentor's uh, uh, office because he had been in electron microscopy in in the nineteen forties, and he detected um, <clears throat> he found the uh, the scales that makes the make the interference. Um, pattern on butterfly wings okay so in 1943 and he had a he had a microscope that was mounted like a cannon uh it, it was it was in a <clears throat> oblique way uh the cathode was where your your feet are and <clears throat> and the and the screen was close to your face <clears throat> And uh, and then and then he had, it had pulleys uh, to <clears throat> to change the the focus. So that was my first impression of an electron microscope. So it produced <clears throat> curiosity about microscopy. <clears throat> and then, but but then my first microscope, my real microscope, <clears throat> was in Walter Hoppe's lab um, <clears throat> in Munich. But the way I got there was simply because I wanted to stay in Munich. I wanted to stay in Munich and and because wanted to friends? Hmm? because of your friends were there. Well, why? No, I, I like Munich. Meanwhile, I like Munich. I wanted to stay there for my graduate studies, and then I looked for somebody who was doing electron microscopy uh, in Munich. <clears throat> And but the way you know that you had no internet, so and so you you went to a, a into a library, a, and looked at recent conferences and abstracts, uh, you know, abstracts yeah. of conferences, and there I found this little abstract, of of the of Hopper, you know, doing electron microscopy with molecules, and so, <clears throat> so the interest. In biology was really from the Schudian Stiftung. And then <clears throat> electron microscopy came from this very strange thing that I saw in my former mentor's lab. Were you disappointed when you saw the the, the newer type of electron microscope compared to the no, one? No, no, no. I was very <laughs> impressed. It was very large, very large affair. It, it, it looked very complicated. And then in fact, <clears throat> then I learned to use it, and that broke something uh, right at the beginning, and uh, and it was terrible, and then <laughs> uh, uh, <clears throat> and then so it really convinced me that I was not it was I was not was not the right kind to actually interact with the instrument, and that's really brought me into uh, the math and the computation and the software design, you know. 
<laughs> so you don't touch the microscopes. <laughs> that others right. move over. So you love Germany, you love Munich. And then you move to the USA. So you know that this this was another coincidence because <clears throat> because I was um <clears throat> I was nominated. Well, first of all, after my after I did my PhD, I I, I didn't know what exactly to do. Uh, and uh, a first, there was the first concern about uh, environmental uh, the, the way the environment was going, and and there were already beginnings of environmental research. And I looked into this uh, to see whether I could. As a physicist with that kind of background, if I could make a contribution, and uh, I actually talked with someone, and uh, but there was no concrete idea, and then all of a sudden there was an <clears throat> there were I, I saw an announcement of, by the UNESCO uh, that they started some kind of an environmental thing in Kenya, and I applied I applied for it, uh, and I, did, I never got a reply. You know, obviously, I was poorly qualified for anything like this. <clears throat> but but then, coincidentally, I, I got an, uh, <clears throat> uh, I was nominated for the Harkness Fellowship, um, which is, uh, <clears throat> which is an, 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 a fund um, <clears throat> by the uh, Commonwealth Foundation. The Commonwealth F F Foundation was um, <clears throat> was started by the Harkness um, people, uh, Harkness couple, uh, who were in the railroads and uh, in in the United States, and uh, got a lot of money out of this, and they they started this uh, Commonwealth Fund, and among them the Harkness Fellowship. The Harkness Fellowship brings people, uh, I think, still does, from England to the United States for cultural exchange for first exposure. And at the time, they had expanded the program to Europe, uh, and not just to England. And so the, I, I, I qualified and was nominated and, 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 then, and then found, you know, I, I attended a, um, <clears throat> a, some kind of an, uh, an exam uh, in in Frankfurt, so so people were brought there for an exam, yeah. and then I you know had to ask uh, answer all kinds of questions, and then and then I got the fellowship, and it was a great thing because they gave me money to travel in the United States and pick any labs that I wanted for wow. two years, and so I I made contact with um, uh, with various people, and uh, uh, <clears throat> this again. One coincidence, uh, one accident after the other, because <clears throat> I, through through my father, uh, through one of my father's friends, I knew that there wasn't somebody, a researcher doing electron microscopy at Cornell University, and, and that was Ben Siegel, uh, who did experimental research, um, and uh, <clears throat> with a six hundred uh, uh, kV microscope. That was a time when everybody, when, when certain institutions had 600 kV microscopes to play with, and then nothing ever came out of that. <clears throat> so so I, I sort of um, <clears throat> got in touch with him, and he, um, he was delighted, yes, and he made, made all kinds of arrangements. And then I think three weeks before my flight, uh, was uh, was going there? He said, you know, actually, actually, he confessed um, that um, they never got the uh, the uh, scanner to work. Okay, one one needed scanners in, in order to get uh, images into the computer, <clears throat> and uh, but he had a friend at uh, at the JPL at the Jet Propulsion Lab. And uh, he suggested that I go there first, and then to him. Um, <clears throat> and so I went up at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, instead of at Cornell, <clears throat> which of course at the time 
was the uh, was the most advanced lab in the world in image processing. Okay, so so it it was it was great fun to be there in that kind of environment. So so that's in California, yes. Yeah, in Pasadena. So you you love Munich, and you had this big. How old were you when you went to California? Oh, uh, maybe. 23 or some no, no wait a moment uh no i i was that was 70 no 30 years okay uh, so you you 30. love munich you went to munich to follow friends you then love munich yeah it's big step to then go from munich to california were you and, and i'd imagine culturally the us then was very different very different i i i i, I it was it was terrifying, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> and uh, you know people people didn't walk on the streets, uh, you know, especially Pasadena and and uh, <clears throat> um, you know the culture was so completely different. But but the <clears throat> but the uh, but the money that I got from this foundation was such that um, <clears throat> I. I we were able to to buy um, a used car, uh, a cabriolet, and and um, a convertible, uh, and a fantastic car. Uh, and so we were sort of flung into this completely different world there, uh, <laughs> driving around in a in a convertible, uh, in an open convertible. <clears throat> Just you that went over. You said we. No, no. I, 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 uh, I got married in uh, uh, 1968, um, and uh, so I uh, met met my wife in uh, Munich. Um, we got divorced later on uh, after uh, uh, after I went to the United States for the second time. <clears throat> But at the time, I cruised around with my with my wife, and uh, we went to the various different places. So, from the from the JP, JPL, uh, you know, at the time there were the space missions. The the images came in uh, for the first time, and uh, it wasn't you know it was a great, a very interesting environment. And then, uh, uh, from from there. Uh, we visited um, Berkeley because we had so many. Uh, we heard so much about the hippies and things like this, and hey, the, the Ashbury, um, and then and then all of a sudden, um, it dawned on us that you know going from Pasadena to Cornell would would be would be pretty awful, you know, uh, and we wanted to have some time in Berkeley. <clears throat> And uh, so I reached out to um, Bob Glaser. Um, <clears throat> so Bob Glaser, um, and he was delighted to have me there for three quarters of an hour of a year or so. Um, and uh, before I, I, we would go to uh, Cornell, and and there that that was a very decisive um, period of time because uh, he was. Uh, doing experiments in uh, radiation damage, um, and he played around with hydration, uh, hydration chambers, and and um, uh, and did the first um, cryo uh, cryo experiments, uh, which didn't work that well because he used liquid nitrogen um, rather than um, propane, so or propane or or ethane. Yeah, ethane yeah. It, it was the breakthrough later on by de Gaucher. But at the time, that was already a very interesting environment because he he found out the uh, <clears throat> very strong uh, radiation sensitivity of of, uh, of proteins and so on. So it, so that brought me in, into that kind of place. So 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 that's really. Just, just checking back. I think that's probably your first bio interaction. Then, when you got with Bob, uh, and start to go more biological. Right, right. Uh, yes. 
that, hence the biological world you're, you're so well known. Did you see yourself carrying on around the bio applications or did you see yourself moving back into more chemical type work or just the, the hardcore physics side of things? Well, I, 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 I was really already very focused on image processing as a way of, of getting structures of, of molecules. Um, so, so I saw myself getting into structural biology, but the term didn't exist at the time, you know. <clears throat> wow, so it's just, just, and of course, you know, then got on the x-ray side. How much did you, did you have, uh, excuse my ignorance, did you have much to do with the x-ray structural biology, or do you always keep with the electron side and the structural? I was always on the ele electron side. I in uh, at the at the Hopper place, Hopper himself was an X-ray crystallographer who had developed an interest in electron microscopy, and so <clears throat> so I was aware of of the essentially the theoretical background and and the sort of the infrastructure that had developed there, uh, <clears throat> but but I I continue to be focused on. Uh, on the electron microscopy part, and he, I was encouraged by him to to stay uh, in that in that area. <laughs> now, is that because he didn't want you to compete against him in the X-ray area, or because he actually was visionary enough to realize what the electrons would do? Because the X-ray, no, he was, yeah, yeah, he he was visionary enough, uh, but he was very impractical he, he, because because he was always ahead of himself and other people. Uh, so uh, he he never came out with 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 a proposal that could really be realized, uh, <clears throat> and uh, that I mean immediately when when he hired me he he spoke about uh, you know taking X-ray programs and rewriting them a little bit uh, in order to you know get three-dimensional reconstruction in electron microscopy. When when I first when I saw the quality of of the of electron <clears throat> microscope data, uh, I saw that completely completely different kinds of approaches were needed um, for, that that were that existed in statistical optics and and so on from completely different fields. Uh, one had to import concepts in order to even uh, deal with these kinds of data. <clears throat> just, just changing tack a little minute with the four countries. The first of the quick fire questions would be, and this is, this is probably unfair because this is what it was like back then, but Germany or the UK? What would what be your Germany or the UK? What, what, what about it? Uh, yeah. Which one would you prefer? Which is your favorite? Germany, UK? Well, Germany is, is, is where I grew up, so it's, it's an unfair question. Okay. I've never, never uh, grown up in, in the UK. Okay, um, it's going to get harder. UK yeah. or USA? Um, well, there, <clears throat> what um, what really uh, is important is that um, we wound up in England. Now, England is a is is not a very warm, you know, emotionally warm part of the UK. Uh, oh, it, it, what it's are you <laughs> It's it's true. It's true. It's it's really as an as somebody coming from somewhere else. Uh, it it is you you get the idea. You have to stay there for twenty years, and then you are still somehow uh, <clears throat> not not really from there. Uh, it's different between I you know we notice the difference between England and Wales and Ireland very very strongly. So. <clears throat> So UK in itself is a is is not a not a not a real good question. You have to say England or or Wales or something no, like that. I, I, I <laughs> so I, I presume you're saying USA in this case. So USA or Germany? Um, well, Nib. Yeah. Well, it, it's 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 again. You know, I, my emotional roots are in. Germany. Uh, however, uh, I, I really, um, I really um, 
found myself found myself really welcoming uh, to get immersed in in into a different language. Uh, the uh, German the German language was really contaminated uh, by the Nazi era. Uh, it, it was very difficult to express yourself. Um, I, I'm talking about expressing myself in fiction or poetry and whatever. It, it, it was really uh, contaminated by word associations. So, so you, you, in order to express yourself, you had to you had to sort of go in a roundabout way, um, and and so reinventing yourself in the in English language was was very refreshing to me. Now you could say I could have done the same thing in the UK, UK, uh, but I was not in the UK long enough yeah. uh, to to really um, uh, you know go uh, on with with uh, with different kinds of um, activities. You know. <clears throat> It's interesting you talk about poetry and everything else. And you sent me this picture. It's probably a good time to bring this picture into the background. Uh, so these are your books, or, or a book that you have published. Uh, so actually, um, those who are listening. Well, uh, well I mean, one book. I, I, I only published one book, which, which is the one with the with the lady, uh, Anze. The other. The other ones are, are simply books in, in waiting. Uh, they are manuscripts, and I I put fancy covers there uh, that that I might use or not use. <clears throat> Tell me, what is the book about? What type, what what genre is the book? What's it about? Uh, it, it's all uh, literary fiction. So I write literary fiction. Uh, and so it's a novel, um, but um, I can best think myself into a scientist. So this is a scientist. It's not me, but it's a scientist. And and so this scientist has European roots, as I. Um, he's, he is in the United States. Um, and, uh, and he gets a chance to visit Europe again. Um, and uh, in fact, it's a it's a conference uh, on fluid dynamics in uh, in the Hague, uh, in Scheveningen. Uh, so he winds up there, um, and uh, and is confronted with this hotel. This hotel is bizarre. It's it's like a uh, labyrinth, uh, and uh, so so he spends some time there. He. He runs into his uh, a former girlfriend um, a, a, in in Scheveningen, and then a, uh, after <clears throat> and this affair rekindles again, and then um, and then sort of, but then it it stops, and and he is sort of very um, very down. Uh, and then he takes a he takes a train ride to Austria to visit his aunt, um, and on the on the trip he he comes down with a, with a strange viral disease, um, and uh, which which uh, leaves him handicapped. Um, and then he spends months uh, under the care uh, of his aunt, um, and. Uh, and then slowly recovers. <clears throat> I have to ask, why Skaveningen? Oh, that, that's an obscure place on the coast near the Hague. Oh, uh, it's simply because I was I was uh, in a conference in in the Hague, uh, and and I, I actually attended. I was on this in this hotel Anze, uh, and uh, so that gave me the inspiration later on. To write a short story, I wrote a short. I, I came to the United States. I was in Albany, um, a, and and I took fiction writing uh, lessons uh, from a man uh, who gave who gave these classes at the at the public library, and his name was William Kennedy, 
he was not known at the time. <clears throat> so, so he gave these classes for me and some host calls. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and I uh, put in this short story about Anze, which was inspired by the, by the uh, trip. And he said, this is fantastic. This is, this is absolutely fantastic. And, and he told me, you have to expand it into a novel. Okay. You, you, uh, <clears throat> and so, so I, I got very encouraged by this and then wrote and wrote and wrote. And then it became, it became something, you know, uh, a much larger piece. <clears throat> that, that's awesome. I, I, my interest in Skagen again is my, uh, I used to, my late friend, uh, Ben van der Ben. Uh, I used to go and visit Netherlands quite often. Near, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And he, used to, he used to take me there with his mom, Johnny, and we used to watch the international fireworks there. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this place, uh, kind of a fun place. I look forward to seeing what the, the next books will be. Yeah, okay. So I, I'm going to go to quick five questions because <laughs> I think I now know the answer to one of them. But here we go. Are you an early bird or a night owl? um i'm i'm actually both uh so uh, right now i'm i'm really getting up at at six o'clock uh and uh, i just i just like to i like to sort of have have time uh, in the morning uh, to do all kinds of things um and uh so yeah I'm, typically i have to have two hours uh, to play around essentially and do all kinds of things and then Absolutely. later later on later on uh i really appreciate the time to uh to write um and uh, yeah i yeah no that's good are you a pc or mac person uh i'm a, a mac mac, mac person. yeah yeah right. mcdonald's or burger king neither i knew that was going to be the answer <laughs> if you were to to go out to eat what type of food would you like to go to what type of restaurant do you like a mediterranean okay. uh, very much yeah um yeah to, to, at the time if you uh, I, i'm sure many times you're taken out to dinner and you don't get a choice about what you're going to eat it's put in front of you what is your favorite food that they can have? What is actually the favorite dish they could put in front of you? Favorite food, favorite dish. Um, I think uh, something like lasagna. Ah. Uh, I like I like food that is in some way integrated, uh, diverse inside, uh, has texture. Uh, I tend to be more vegetarian now than than I used to be. Um, there's some exceptional vegetarian foods that uh, exist. Meanwhile, yep, and a good corn lasagna actually is is, is uh, for me preferred over beef lasagna. Personal preference. Uh, what is the worst dish that could be put in front of you? What is the, the worst dish? The worst dish, the worst food. Oh, dish. Yeah. The worst dish. Um, I think um, that would be, uh, there, there are a lot of worst dishes. Um, uh, kidney pie. Um, oh, okay. uh, <laughs> you know, um, and then and then liver. Oh, uh, I like liver. I mean, I, I'm really running away from this. I mean, I can't even be <laughs> on the same table. <laughs> With this kind of stuff, I, I, what's worse, kidney or liver? Or are they both equally bad? Um, they are really equally bad. They, but but it, it's really multidimensional. They are they they're bad in different ways, in different directions, and and so it's it's a, sort of an unfair question. I uh, think. The I'm quite fond of liver. I cannot do kidney. Yeah at all oh, yeah that, i hadn't contemplated that in my worst dish but that's a good one coffee or tea coffee <laughs> he says drinking <laughs> what looks like a coffee cup no the... they, they, they do it's water actually yeah <clears throat> beer or wine wine 
red or white? White. Oh, I didn't expect that with a Mediterranean the sand. No, in no, I get in, I, I get headaches with with red red wine. Okay. I, it, it, it was difficult to foresee. Yeah. Uh, uh, chocolate or cheese? Chocolate. Chocolate or cheese? Chocolate or cheese? Yeah. Well, I would never choose between them at the same time. I, I would, <laughs> these are at, at different times, you know. But you're a fan of both? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, TV or book? Oh, um, <clears throat> I think book. Uh, book is, is sort of a sentimental preference. Uh, because I like myself to be a book reader, but then the COVID time has brought me so much into the TV uh, era. Uh, I, I, you know, we've been we've been watching so many things, so many shows. Yeah. What have uh, you been watching? Oh, oh God! Uh, all the South Korean uh, movies. Uh, I an unbelievable number of of Korean movies. Um, and, uh, and even, uh, movies from, um, uh, uh, that take place in Istanbul, uh, entire series that go on for 50 episodes and they always involve very stink, stinky, riches, uh, people, mm -hmm. uh, that always have affairs and, and, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, things in the closet. <laughs> That, that that's a brilliant answer a really brilliant answer uh my next question you mentioned film do you have a favorite film film yeah um oh well uh the, the princess pride you know uh oh, yeah you you know that uh, no i don't i'm sorry the princess pride you don't know princess pride oh, i'm sorry okay. No, oh, but, well, it, it it is it is such a classic. Uh, it is meanwhile meanwhile there are some reunions uh, of actors, uh, and uh, uh, and the audience the audience know every single word, and you know it's it's really fantastic. You know. So, the next question is that Star Trek or Star Wars? Um, I'm really very much bored by these things. No, um, neither. Not no, so sci fi. No. Yeah. Okay. And one, one thing I ask everyone is do you have a favorite Christmas film? Christmas film? Yeah. Um, no, I, you know, I sort of, I, I, I was weaned out of Christmas by marrying uh, my Jewish wife. Uh, uh, this is my second wife, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, I I don't really I I don't have a lot of sentiments about Christmas. I mean they they're memories from uh, from early childhood, but uh, but I I'm sort of I I have a bit of a resentment against the whole Christmas um, <clears throat> uh, Christmas show, the wraparound and everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what other hobbies do you actually, so obviously you're an author, you write, and that's your hobbies. Do you have any other hobbies? Uh, photography. Uh, photography, and, and I, I, I really, I, I, like, I like the accidental discoveries, the things that, that are sort of on the wayside, the mm -hmm. things that in the cracks between, uh, yeah, there, there's, there's something. So okay. this is a picture for those listening of, uh, it's just a trash bin. It yeah, is, yeah, but uh, but, but uh, look, it, uh, something uh, is looking out out at you there. I mean, it's such a such a strong impression there, uh, and uh, I mean, and so there's so many things, and and what I love is is the struggle between um, civilization and 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 the innate um, life, you know, the plants and so forth. And sometimes I see little little plants coming out of the cracks um uh, mm. and <clears throat> and then 
yeah yeah you also see so you sent me a few pictures i've only picked a few of these and but you see science in these pictures as well i presume i i this this picture slightly worried because it makes it look like i've got a massive hairdo so i'm it's, it's, it's a donut well, yeah what? yeah uh, no, no. I mean, this is a this is a huge um, <clears throat> uh, trunk, uh, you know, a tree trunk, yeah. which is hollowed out in the middle, and and I I and it it you know you you can put the camera in different ways and I put it in such a way that that there is some kind of an a scene at 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 the end. So I made it into um, and I'm I'm fascinated about uh, putting a, a juxtaposition between images and text. So I may make up a legend about this. And for me, it was a one-to-one a -one telescope. Okay, it's a telescope that just has a magnification of one. And, uh, and, and so the only thing that it's doing is really, it, it, uh, <clears throat> it masks out uh, a particular area of interest. Okay, so it's pointed, uh, uh, and then you see in the background there's a little, <clears throat> there's a little of everything. There's an, um, there's the pebbles, there's a rock, there's a little bit um, of the, uh, of the forest, and it's just fantastic. And then after after that, I found a number of things like this, that could also be telescopes. <clears throat> well, this is, uh, yeah, this, is the game. But, but this, this tells a story. This tells a story because here <clears throat> we have an uh, we have this piece of, of seaweed, uh, and uh, <clears throat> and then the, the water washed over it in a particular direction, and so the 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 texture of this object produces a texture of the background. And uh, you know, this is all fascinating. And <clears throat> it, it is the science, but again, you're also you're not just seeing the scene, you're seeing the science that's being created. Yeah, by, yeah. You know, for for me, when I looked at those, I can see the scientist in your photography. Yeah, uh, yeah. You may be seeing, I think I'm certainly seeing a scientist's eye thinking, well, that's interesting because and it is a scientific mind that it's seeing. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I mean, so I for instance, uh, I, I see certain contraptions and they don't make any sense. Uh, they are leftovers of some kind of an, another industrial era. And then I, I get a photograph of this and then and then uh, it's a, <clears throat> uh, to me, it's a perpetual mo motion machine, which which for some reason that, you know, stopped working or something like this, you know? So you, you can really <laughs> go into the myths <laughs> Bring this all together. So, I, 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 we are. I've got about five minutes left. Oh my goodness! Uh, I have to ask. At 10, 12, you want to be a scientist. You become a scientist. If you could do any other job, just for a day or a week, just to see what it's like, what type of job would you like to sample? <clears throat> um. Tuffy. I I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I I I would have liked to be a writer, but I I I just I, I don't know what it what it really would mean from day to day. You know, because I know what it means to have the intensity of concentration on writing, but I couldn't do that for. 12 hours, you know, so I, I could do it for two hours and then I have to imagine what could I do the next three hours and, and you know, so it's 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 very difficult to put myself in, in into this uh, idea and I might, I might not have survived as a writer, really. So on a, on a more back to the science side, uh, obviously you, you've got your Nobel laureate. Did that, what, what are the, very briefly, what are the positives and what are the negatives of winning a Nobel Prize? So I'm sure it's not all positives. 
Well, the positives are, you know, it, it's very flattering. You get the, uh, you get the recognition. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, what we talked about before is all of a sudden the opportunity to, to meet, uh, to meet famous people and uh, and and not uh, not be shy about it and you know I can reach out to uh, <clears throat> people who are, who are really uh, have achievements uh, all by themselves. I, I got to <clears throat> travel. Uh, I got uh, fancy invitations everywhere. Uh, the downside is is really uh, that they are. There are so many, there are so many choi uh, choices of, of these things, and I'm getting overwhelmed by it. It is very difficult to um, essentially even 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 this this the, the entire <clears throat> uh, uh, <clears throat> composure uh, of, of 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 constant gratitude, you know. Uh, and then the other thing, the very, very difficult thing is, is that all of a sudden I'm, I'm being asked about uh, <clears throat> opinions that I shouldn't have any opinion about, you know, because I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not an expert. But, but somehow people seem to think that, um, you know, because I have achievement in one area, uh, my judgments in all areas are are very, very sound and so forth. And that's the dangerous part because I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, uh, <clears throat> exploit uh, that, that kind of um, opportunity. Well, I'm glad, I feel flattered because A, you invited to say to lots of things and you said yes to this. So that's, thank you. And uh, the negative when you were saying you get asked about all sorts of things i thought you were going to say your hobbies and photography i thought oh no <laughs> that, that's what we just covered uh yeah. we are up to the hour mark already and you know what you said how to become famous enable you to meet more famous people but i will do a call out to that lindo meeting and the opportunity to encourage those early careers to not see barriers and to come up and say hello, be polite, but don't be intimidated. We're all scientists. You're, you know, one thing I've learned through doing this is everyone is exceptionally approachable and likes to talk. And not necessarily just about science, but to show how science develops. Uh, so I, yeah. I, I have to ask you one more question. We know what you're famous for, but is the one thing that you are most proud of in your research career? <clears throat> most proud of um sorry it's a tough question oh uh, well i i think i think the most proud of is is that really that i was able to <clears throat> make contributions to uh <clears throat> the structural basis of uh, protein synthesis um i would never have thought that i would ever get into that direction and it was really all by accident uh, because <clears> the <throat> ribosome was just such a perfect molecule to demonstrate uh, the technology with. And all of a sudden, I found myself making actual contributions to biology. And that was really something that was, I, I never uh, uh, could, could foresee. But if I take you back to when you went to the USA, you looked at the UNESCO application, you wanted to help the environment because you saw that as an upcoming problem. Arguably, because people are now solving structures of proteins that they couldn't do before, these have implications in environmental biology. So have you ever reflected back and think, actually, through my work, you are now having an impact through others' work using what you've helped develop? Well, I see. I see in a uh, very large impact. Uh, I, I, actually, I don't. I don't see the one uh, in in the direction of, of environmental sciences that that much. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, I, I don't. I don't. I don't really see this. Um, oh, I, I think once you know the structure of the proteins and how they work and how they can 
be promoted to help store more carbon dioxide and so forth. A lot of those yeah, sure. are yeah. proteins, and I. It, yeah, it, but but I, I mean, we, we, <laughs> in this way, I can really be connected now to uh, to uh, all sciences, uh, you know, mm. because they are always pathways. Yeah, but that's why it's so amazing. You you may have gone down one route, but the impact it has by the by yeah. the, what you've done and, and to different fields. Yeah, it, it, it's it's really absolutely staggering. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, if if I if I think about if, if I think about uh, you know eight eight uh, titans in Abu Dhabi or something like this, you know, <laughs> this is all coming out. <laughs> It is quite amazing. Look, we have to stop now because it is up to the hour. Okay. You're an amazing guest. And I think what strikes me is, in your own words, you've kind of had accidental impacts that you didn't foresee through an accidental career, which I think was your words earlier on, and all led to a Nobel. But you're still yachting. You're still so influential. You like to meet people and really... I think it's inspirational and I, I maybe you don't realize just how big an effect and impact you've had outside your own area and how that's I don't know trickled it's not trickled down but how it's spread throughout mm -hmm. the community thanks thanks very much I can't wait to meet up in person soon and yeah. Rocky thank you so much today yeah. yeah take care thank you for listening to the microscopists a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy to view all audio and video recordings from this series, please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the microscopists.